probably other incarnations of it, but but you know, it, it shows on there, you know, five mile radius, 10 mile radius, 15, 20. And uh, turn that stuff on, it's not always turned on. It's something you gotta go turn on in the settings. And uh, and so that way when you, you know, if you you go do the uh, best slide thing, which we'll talk about in a second, um, then you, you know at the glance of a, you know, one glance, if the engine craps out right now, how far I can go, how far I can glide. Because that's, you know, that's 10 miles and, you know, if you know your glide ratio on, on my plane is about 11 and a half to one, and you start thinking in terms of, you know, every 5,000 feet so is a mile close to it. And, uh, and so every, you know, every, every uh, thousand, you know, say every, it's just 11, if it's 11,000, if you're up at, at um, God, I can't even do math today. Um, so you, you get the picture though, the higher you are, the further you can glide. And, and so you, you develop in your mind that uh, like if I'm up 10,000 feet, I'm, I can glide close to 22 miles, something like that. So, um, because you, you know, because glide rates are so good. So, you know, gliding 22 miles, you, they're just about in the southeast anyway, no place you can't glide to at, at 10,500 feet. So, um, so anyway, it's important, I think, to turn all that stuff on if you don't have it on. Uh, and even some of them have dynamic ones to where when you throttle back, and you go into a glide, it automatically shows you, it, of course it's not accurate if you're flying along at 160 miles an hour, but as soon as you throttle back and go to best glide speed, it's pretty dang accurate as to how far you can go. So, uh, so I got them both turned on, on, uh, on my, both of them on my iFly and my MGL IAPIS thing. And there's a, so the, but the, um, let's see, for the, the best glide thing, you know, you, I'm sure y'all all can figure this out and know how, and most people have done it, but that's the point of your, uh, of your test flight, your, uh, your test phase, test one phase, phase one, whatever they call it. And uh, it's, it's to go do all these tests and figure out what, what the dang glide rate of your plane is so that you have that number tucked away in your head and uh, you know, glide at the best glide speed. Um, for my plane, or, you know, five, six Mike Lima was somewhere around 80 miles an hour. Uh, 80, something like that, 80, and even for uh, for Jim Fong's plane, it's it's in the neighborhood of 75 or 80. So, um, so the, the first thing you want to do, let's go to the next next slide. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that should have gone to this earlier. But anyway, so this is this is an example of the the fixed guys with the with the miles on them somewhere, uh, 10 miles. I think that's right. Yeah, that's 10 miles, and this one's 20 miles. I don't know where the 20 got buried, but but anyway, um, depending on your altitude and all this stuff. This was flying into uh, uh, Jeff Scott's place, and um, so but you can you can see you know what which of these airports I can make and which ones I can't. Well, that's, there's an airport, and there's another one. Well, his airport. But um, and this guy is one of the variable ones, and the reason it's weird oblong is because. That thing refreshes constantly, and it draws vectors on it. When you take a picture of it, it freezes it. But that thing is constantly, depending on you know, as you, you can't, don't maintain a, a steady glide, it, it gets bigger or gets smaller. And that's a really easy way to figure out exactly what your you know, what your best uh, where, what your glide, glide distance is, and therefore what speed you're going to get there. So you get to the point where you've got that the biggest circle you can keep it, and then it makes it really easy to find out what your best glide speed is. Wind. Wind calculations will that take it? Yeah, uh, you gotta. Yeah, that's. I think that's probably on the next slide. But that's something you always gotta keep in your back pocket is what the winds at altitude are and all that kind of junk. But that circle will take that into account. No, it doesn't. I don't because uh, it doesn't know. I don't think it knows. I don't think this guy's uh, anything is smart enough to know where the wind's going. Now you could. Yeah, theoretically you could check the the um, the true airspeed uh, with the um, ground speed. And at 154, 175, and figure there's, there's something funny going on there, um, <laughs> you know. So uh, there's a yeah, there was a tailwind, I guess, going out there on that particular occasion. Is that not saying 28 headwind from the north? Uh, yeah, that's north. Oh, it may, yeah, maybe. Yeah, show you a headwind. So maybe. You, had a, you had a headwind. Yeah, so it, it, it can figure it out. It should be able right. to, given yeah. given those two numbers, and right. and now it's yeah, that's right. It's got ADSB and and all that junk, so it's it's figuring it out. Next slide. That's why it collapses in because you have a headwind on that second. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It is taking that in. Yeah, now. yeah, you're right. Yeah. It sure is. I didn't think this particular thing was that smart, uh, but anyway. Um, 
something else I was going to point out. Yeah, I was burning 45.3 gallons an hour. I was actually getting pretty, I was getting pretty good. Uh, most of the time it reads about 90 or 95. Sometimes I hit 98. So, uh, yeah, it's a thirsty dang airplane. You know? yeah. I mean, it's calibrated. It used to, it worked fine for about the first month or two, and it just went flat crazy. And uh, these numbers just dance around. These guys, just, you know, doing that all the time. All the numbers are flashing constantly. It's like, long story on getting started. You probably heard me around about that. Yeah. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pathetic at this. Um, so, yeah, now we're, now we're down to, to the uh, dynamic range range. Okay, so this is a whole different, this was, uh, this was just the other day. I, well, yeah, I was up to, uh, oh yeah, I was, oh, I was sitting in the hangar. No, that's why I had zero. It's actually accurate at zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time it's accurate. It's kind of like a stop clock on the wall. Anyway, next. I said that. It was actually doing, doing 85. Yeah, it was, it, it was, I was actually flying when I took that. So just here's an example of, say, the iFly stuff, which I think is, to me, the iFly is, uh, I mean, I got four flight and iFly, and, you know, the real pilots use four fly. Four flight, um, but it's it to me it's just way too dang complicated. It's just you know there's so many swipes and this and that and the other and, and hold your mouth just right. This thing is intuitively obvious the the iFly GPS software, and it, you just um, it, it it all makes perfect sense and it's just real quick intuitive to sit down uh, and and get places. Um, but anyway, I'm just giving you an example of you know go look at the the, the uh, filters and stuff associated with the with those. Um, with the range of rings and all that junk, but also the uh, the nearest airports is something you need to get real familiar with and make sure that stuff is set up right. And this is what it looks like when I fly. Just hit the nearest button and it shows you, you know, the four the four nearest airports. Whichever you know, it shows you which direction which direction to turn to get there from from where where you're at and how far it is, how long the runways are, and all that kind of junk. And it, you know, you pick the one that you can, you know, that you want to, that you know you can make that has the, like the nicest, longest runway. So it's all common sense. Hit that button, and this, this stuff goes away, and it plots your new course. So I'm, all you guys know all this already. But I'm just, I'm just pointing out, go set this stuff up. Make sure you're ready when, when the thing and you quit. I know that'll never happen to you though. So, um, so yeah, there you go. Get a little ahead of myself. So in phase one testing, I got way ahead of myself because I covered this on the first slide. But here's a bunch of uh, a bunch of good links for uh, how to do you know phase one testing and all that kind of stuff. And uh, like I said before, this is this is what you're supposed to do in phase one testing is go get all these numbers that you need. To go up, and figure out exactly what your stall speed is, and and uh, and some other things. Next. And one of them, well, here's here just, yeah, here's just some basic ones that you, this is just the, the sh very short list of things you've got to do. But, um, you know, go up to altitude and, uh, and figure out what your stall speed is, with, both with, with or without flaps or belly board or whatever it is you're doing, and, uh, and set up in landing configuration, like your throttle back and, you know, gliding in and all that stuff. Um, and to me, it's real important to learn how to slip, and uh, you know, if, if you if you grew up with a flight instructor in a Cessna, you may not have ever even done any dang slip uh, testing or slip experience at all. But um, I didn't I really didn't realize I had you know I don't know uh, uh, eighty hours under my belt before, before I ever dang slipped an airplane before, and um, and I first I mean the first time I really went flying with a, you know, an instructor that really made you do stuff and if you found out you didn't know how to do stuff it's like well we're about to do one so so we we did a slip and uh and i never really you i really never realized that rudder pedal had eight inches of travel on it you know <laughs> and you stomp your foot into that guy that airplane turns sideways and you start losing altitude like an elevator and uh, you know most of you guys know this but if not I'm, I'm trying to give you a clue that you can lose altitude in a hurry in a slip and, uh, and a lot of people are afraid of them because they're afraid they'll fall out of the sky. But, but how you figure that out is go to six or 8,000 feet, stand on the dang left rudder pedal, and then you line up with a road or something, 
And, uh, and so the airplane is doing like this, but you want to go that way, so now you've got to give it aileron in the opposite direction. So you're, you're traveling like this, but you're, you're just like an elevator. It loses altitude like you would not believe. And so that's just one of the, one of, one of the ways that I protect myself when I land because you never know how you're going to land and what the circumstances are going to be. Next. I got way, way ahead of myself. So, so you know, we've already talked about glide ratios and how to figure that out, figure out what it is. Um, and and a, and a way to do this, there's several ways to do it. There's inaccuracies involved in, in probably all of them. There's probably more accurate ways than others. But what I went, I went to 10,000 feet and just pull the throttle back to idle. And, and started, of course, I had, had this uh, EIS in, engine information system on there that's recording a data point every second. So it's very easy to go back and look at the data trail, uh, you know, stick it in a spreadsheet and start looking at it. And you can, you can analyze exactly what's going on every second. And so you can average numbers and, and things in there and figure out what, what averages are and all this sort of stuff and throw out, you know, outlier data points and all that. But, but you basically figure out how long it takes you to go from 10,000 feet down to whatever altitude that you're comfortable, you know, you, hopefully you're gonna come down near your airport and you, whenever you get to pattern altitude, then you, you know, you, you say, well, that's where I'm gonna quit gathering data points and you come back and average all this stuff. And you do it for, and you do this all at a certain speed, say 70 miles an hour, and then do it, at, do it go up again, do it again at 75 miles an hour, and then do it at 80, and then do it at 85. And what you'll end up with is, is the knowledge of which one of these speeds is pretty much your best glide speed, where you cover the most ground, which is the whole point if you're even quits, you want to go as far as you can. Um, you may want to go as far as you can. The best airport may be right down there. So it, it may be a no-brainer, you don't have to ever use this, but you need to have, if you have this stuff in the back of your head, then you know in the back of your mind you have an idea at any given time whether or not you can make it to an airport or not, is, is the point. Mark, on your last slide, you said ask me something about the full power off stalls. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to tell a few stories while I was there. I'll tell you about my first, the first stall in my plane. Is it been a long time? Yeah, I really, I went and got a check ride, you know, because I hadn't flown in a long time. I started out trying to stay current and until um, I had my, four month old son sitting in the front seat of the Cessna that I rented and I basically did a wheelbarrow landing on the you know to the thing and you know I was like, you know what, flying every three months to save money, this is retarded. I am gonna this is bad. And so uh, so I decided I was gonna put my time and money in the in the building on the plane and I would just kind of start over again. I mean I had my license, but I wasn't gonna try to stay proficient for that time. It's like I'll just I'll just quit. I'm gonna put my nose to the grindstone and build a dang airplane. Well, then I went out and got a check out, a check ride with this lady who we went in a, in a 172. Well, that's like flying a dang your armchair, you know? I mean, it lands itself. You can just like you pull back the throttle and it lands, you know? And I didn't learn anything from that check ride. Um, but, well, oh, the, but so I go out, we, and I think we did a stall. Well, well she's sitting there telling you, 1500 RPM, do this, you know, pull back, pull back. Well, I'm out on my own, and you know, I'm going up to find out what you know what my stall speed is. I kind of forgot the part about pulling back on the throttle, and I just I was flying along at you know regular regular speed and stuff, and uh, and so which is pretty dang fast. You know, I was probably doing a uh, hundred and and I was close to wound out. It was pretty much almost wide open at the time. So I haul back on the stick, and then that thing climbs like crazy, and then it keeps climbing, and it keeps climbing, and then finally when it went. It, it, it just immediately swapped ends, and I was upside down, headed straight to the ground. And you, to, to see, uh, you saw what Roger's plane was doing going up against gravity. Imagine gravity being on your side, <laughs> you know. And so uh, I was headed straight at the ground. I don't have any idea how fast I went, because I literally didn't have time to look. I was pretty much trying to get the throttle back, and I, the first th thought in my head was, am I going to rip the wings off this dang airplane right now? Because I'm headed for the ground. I mean, I had, I was at five or 6,000 feet when I did that. I had plenty of room, but I got news for you. I was sweating bullets that I was going to hit the ground. And it was like, how, how quick can I pull out 
and not hit the dang ground and not not pull the dang wings off this airplane. So don't learn to stall like I did. That's I later learned that's an accelerated stall. They're nasty as hell and they have a reputation for killing people. So at least what, from what I could tell you. This is in your KOR? Yeah. Uh, my first stall. Don't do what I did. That's what this is all about. Don't do what I do and don't do what I did. So, uh, so this is how I typically land. And, and I, I arrived at this after my first engine out, um, which, which happened, uh, I was over um, Huntsville when I hit my 40 hours. And I'm like, you know, I've always just wanted to go down and fly up the Tennessee River and just fly along and look at the river and you go up to land at Gunnersville, that's a cool little airport. Out of, over the water, you can literally come in over the lake and land over the water, that's a cool place. I'm gonna go do that, celebrate my 40 hours. And so um, I was flying along, fat, dumb, and happy at, I think it was 5,500 feet. And so I, uh, I gave it, um, I gave it uh, full throttle to climb. I was like, well, yeah, I'm over the city here, and that's not comfortable. I need to go you know, further enough, far enough. I'm going to climb out and go some. So I went full throttle, and the crank broke about five, ten seconds later. And uh, so here I am over town, not where you want to have a like, you know, dead engine. And so I immediately go to the nearest airport and went, if I see if I had, had my GPS up. Well, I mean, I had a GPS, but I wasn't paying attention to what's really the nearest airport. The, the, the nearest airport was probably Moontown. It's not that far. But um, I don't remember exactly where I was over town because everything kind of turned into a blur after that. But, but I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to the, what I thought was the nearest one, which was uh, Huntsville. Huntsville's airport, and besides, they got big runways and all this stuff. But if you don't get there, it doesn't matter how dang big the runways are. And so, so I started heading that way. And this was before I got smart and, and started. I learned don't fool with the radio. That's retarded. Just don't mess with it. Forget it. Nobody cares what's happening to you anyway. They're not going to help you if you don't. You know, they, yeah, if you're in a in a, a fog bank that can vector you to the right place, but it's a perfect day. You're just you're on your own. You know, they're not going to do anything that helps you. And but anyway. Um, and I, I'm not sure that I was even on uh, radar. I guess I was. He had a transponder, but I mean, I had a transponder. But I'm thinking it's not like I was doing flight following, just driving around the patch. But anyway, so I started. Anyway, the bottom line is, no way could I have ever made Huntsville. But what I forgot about was the fact that Redstone Arsenal has an airport, and it was between me and Huntsville. And so, I, so I ended up landing there. But I, I, I really, the, the minute the crank broke. The, the vibration was so violent, I had serious pictures of the engine falling off. And when the engine falls off, you're dead. You know, you just kind of fall out of the sky like a leaf, and you're done. And so I switched it off and, uh, and, and said, wow, look at that. You know, and you become a glider. And so I started gliding towards, uh, towards Redstone. And, uh, and then just for kicks, I, was, uh, I decided, you know what, I, I may need that. I may need a little bit more. If I get down to it, I want to make sure this thing will start again. And I turned it on and it started right up. And I'm like, okay, I'll just save that for my back pocket. And uh, I ended up needing it when I turned base to get to, uh, to, the, to the runway. I was probably going to be about 200 feet too short. And I fired it up just, just another 10 seconds, and that got me to the runway. And that's how close that was. It's a good thing I had a little left in that thing, you know. So uh, anyway, that, I'm, I'm trying to tell y'all some of these stories to make you realize that this stuff does happen, and it can happen to you. Um, so, so what I do because of that experience and several others I'll talk about in a minute is I always go in high, way high. And, and part of the problem is I have a hard time seeing out of that plane where the dang airport is. If I'm going to some new place I've never been to before. Um, I have a hard time picking out the airports. You know, they're, they're just camouflaged sometimes, and, and it's hard, hard for me to find, not, you know, having never been there before. So I tend to fly in high anyway. I fly high, period. I flew up here at 10.5. When I go back, I'll either go at 95 or 11.5, depending. But the higher you are, the farther you glide. It's just simple physics, you know, and uh, unless the winds are really howling <coughs> in the wrong direction, uh, you know, if you go to a Weathermeister or one of those things and you plug in your, your speed and where you're going, most of the time, the difference in headwinds, oh, in the grand scheme of things, is pretty dang minor. It's a matter of two or three minutes over the time of flight, even if you got a headwind up there. Now, if it's you know high wind, it makes a difference. That's 
one thing, but typical stuff coming up here, it didn't make a bit of difference. Um, so I just went, I, I go high. I, I really try not to go anywhere below about 65 or 85 or somewhere like that, because, you know, the further you fly. So I always get into the, go into the pattern high, and I just sort of descend on the pattern, you know, on, on a downwind, which is probably a no-no. You're probably supposed to come in at a 45 with the right altitude and all that, but if that dang engine quits, I'm going to make that runway. Um, you know, I'm sorry I've been the rules. Um, uh, I want to, you know, I'm, I announce I'm coming, and you know, hopefully everybody realizes that, and it's clearly obvious, and, and so I come in high, and I come in hot, and, uh, and you know, if there's anybody there, I, I'm probably going to end up in front of them anyway. But um, they're not paying attention, you know, if, if, I, if I come in and sneak in front of them. So I come around and do, I don't do these, what I consider to be insanity that instructors teach. And I know it's all about stabilizing, you know, stabilizing things. So they go out on these three mile downwinds and then turn, make a nice 90 degree turn and then turn back in the whole time the engine's doing 1500 RPM and all that stuff. And yeah, I guess the, the theory is don't touch the throttle and nothing will happen. And that's probably true. You know, you're not sucking a lot of power out of the engine. And uh, it's probably just going to keep on chugging. But, uh, you know, there, you could run out of fuel. You could have car heat issues. But, but I come in high and hot. And, and I don't go way out there in the middle of nowhere. I do a, I do a simple 180 turn. And I've heard people refer to that as, as a military turn. I don't know if that's really how they do it or not. But so, um, so I just do a 180 turn. And I'm still high. And I, and I, I, do, I do that 180 turn right at, uh, right at the uh, obeying the numbers. I just pull the throttle back. And, and so every, every landing I make, I try to make a practice emergency landing. So pull the throttle back and just glide in. And if you do that, I've got 3,800 landings now, something like that. You do that, you get pretty dang good at it, putting it right on the end of the runway or close to it at the right speed. And you, you know, if I come in too high, I drop the flaps. Depending on how it looks, maybe because of which way the wind's blowing or whatever, <coughs> I'll put down flaps when I look like I need it. But no matter what, I put it, I put it down you know, I, I'm, I don't even, even know what the distance is, but maybe a quarter mile out or something with a, with a few uh, hundred feet altitude, um, I'll, I'll drop the flap all the way. And if that doesn't get me there, I'll put it in a, in a honk and slip and, and drop drop whatever altitude I need. Yeah. You start to flip her day or? Huh? You All the time. I'm talking every flight. This is what I do. I'm crazy. And I know a lot of people think, God, can you, can you, Slip a KR, what, what, how does that work? Go to 8,000 feet and try it. It works like a charm, man. You stump that guy, the airplane does this, and start doing that. You do a full slip, full rudder, because I'm always curious. Stomp it to the floor. We yeah, <laughs> can tail, do that. That wood tail won't break off. Try it, you'll like it. Works great. Works great. That's why I'm here, okay? You I want to do, but not gain speed. That's right. And I want you to go back up. Maybe you guys are not doing this. And this is kind of why I decided to try to cover this. Instead of me standing up here talking about the same old crap every year, I'm, that's why I'm trying to, that for the people in here that don't do this, this works. And a KR can do it. And not only do I have experience in my plane, which has got a big old honking rudder on it, is that is a dead stock KR2 out there built as by the plans that you will ever find one, and you can stomp that guy to the floor, and it will it will work. It just works great, and uh, it's and when you on five six Mike Lima, I, I don't know that I've done it much on this plane, but I would be slipping six inches off the dang runway, and it's you know when you just you know you realize I'm a foot off the runway. And it's like, okay, I've, I've burned up all I, all I can on this runway. And then you straighten it out. And it, I mean, literally straighten it out and plant it at the same time. And uh, that's, that's sporting. What's your slip speed? What, What's what? Your slip speed? Whatever, whatever speed I'm going at, and I need to lose altitude. It doesn't matter to me. Forward I, slip. Yeah, it's a forward. Forward slip is for altitude. Yeah, oh, well, whatever. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I called it the wrong thing. This is, I'm, I just call it a slip. So. You have to push the nose over because the tendency whenever you start to slip is the nose is going to come up. So you got you to push the stick. Yeah, I guess I don't think about it. I just do it. But, you know, it's like, you know, you fly on a plane, you just do whatever. It, you, you can. It's, it's Left like, rudder, right rudder, whatever it takes. Whatever, yeah, that's right. Whatever. I don't really pay attention to it. I, you just, 
If the nose comes up, then you make it go back down. But I, you, I don't. I, I'm guilty of not thinking about it. I guess I just do. You do what, whatever you want to make it to do, and it does it. But you start your 180 degree turn at the numbers. At the numbers. Do you? Okay. Don't don't go beyond the end of the. I don't know. Okay. I stop it right there, and, I, and I'm at pattern altitude right there. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 well, I make a point of getting getting to pop to to. Uh, to pattern altitude somewhere on downwind, and uh, and then when I pass the numbers, I pull it back. Of course, I pull it back sooner if I'm coming in at you know 50 miles an hour or whatever, um, in an effort to get it that slow. But if I'm not, then and I know if I'm going a little too hot, okay, you go a little further. But uh, you, you, after after a while, you develop a feel for whether you're going to make it or not. And this is the kind of stuff you want to carry around in your head for when the dang engine quits. What you're describing is what my flight instructor taught me was that if you're at pattern altitude on a downwind, you should never be in a position that you would be too low to make the runway if it quit. Exactly. That's the bottom. I could have written one sentence up here I and that would have been it. I'm a little high and fast too, and I've yeah. had instructors say, you're a little high or you're fast, and it's like, well, we're going to make the runway if it quits spinning. That's all right. Exactly. And it's a comforting feeling. Yep. If you learn to do that, what he's talking about. And a KR does slip great. So that, 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 that's the gist of this slide, except another, another part of this that I tacked on to the bottom is turn backs toward the runway. And I know that's sort of a dirty word to some extent, but it's also, um, it's, it's something you can go to altitude and test and, and figure out what, what it takes, you know, what, what kind of altitude do I need? And I did it in 5.6 Mike Lima to the point where I got, I, you know, I knew if I, was, if I made 500 feet, I was plenty safe. And so once I we hit 500 feet off the ground, I know I can I can do I can make it back to the runway. But you got to plan a little bit. And if the wind's coming from one direction, you uh, you kind of want to you want to go. Um, I just think about that. You, uh, you go into the, yeah go into the wind, and so that you're so you got you don't have to fly way out here. The wind's going to help you. So you're really only flying right there. It becomes more of an oval as you come back in. So you don't you don't have to bank it as hard. So, um, so anyway, you, you got to plan where you're going, and, and yeah, I deviate from straight out and going straight up. I go in the direction of the wind, and, and I like to turn left anyway. I guess we all do because we're so used to left-hand patterns. And so, if, if there's no wind, I just I still go to the right. So that I, I'm, if I have to come back, at least I won't have to go over there and come all the way back. I'll have already been over here, and now all I got to do is come in and not have to bank it so hard. So, um, so you can always go to altitude and, and test that stuff, and after you get uh, on the ground, try it some more, and start with higher numbers. Go to 700 feet and gradually turn it, and say, "Oh man, that was easy." Come back and do it the next time at 650 feet. Try it again. Well, that was easy too. And after a while, you get to the point where you know you know a number that you know dang well you can make, but you don't necessarily want to try for 450 or 400. Until you have to, you know. But um, sometimes landing straight ahead is not the smart thing to do, uh, especially if there's a perfectly good runway behind you that if you had, and that's another reason to climb sort of hard on the way out instead of doing a cruise climb is, uh, and the downside of that though is when we were breaking crankshafts on Corvairs, the four or fifth bearings, that was the hardest, that was the hardest thing on the airplane. I mean, when you, when you really crank it up, you could feel the, the whole plane vibrate every time the blade went down and it was you know doing that bending moment on the prop thing um, and if y'all don't there are a lot of people come up to me and ask me I, to explain it again why a crankshaft break you know and what was that all about and and if y'all hadn't heard my little steel on that I'll just tell you since I got the bully pulpit for the moment but, but it's all about bending forces on the prop and when the the the, the, um, the descending blade gets a better bite uh, in the of the airstream, just because of the the angle it's at, it gets a, a better bite on the air, and the ascending blade just gets less. And the equivalent, I mean, so that's like pulling on the bottom of the prop and pushing on the top, or not not really pushing on the top, but you're pulling on the bottom and you're not pushing on the top. 180 degrees later, you're doing it to the other one. Well, that's the definition of fatigue, because every every 180 degrees, you're pulling on that guy and fatiguing it. And when you can feel it in a really hard climb like that, you can you it's sitting there. It might as well have a guy out there jerking on your dang prop, and uh, and it's also connected to your crankshaft. And 
You know, that, that joint between the, the main and, the, and the, the first rod journal is a, is a U-shape. And you're just sitting there trying to open that guy up, open that guy up, open that guy up. And you're doing that, you know, do the math, you know, at, uh, at 3,000 RPM in a hard climb and that kind of power put into it. It, it's you're you're fatiguing that the end of that dang crankshaft, and and that's why the front bearing fixed it for the Corvairs. It's just what the Volkswagen guys learned 50 years ago. Put a dang front bearing on it, and we put all those forces into the case instead of into the crank. And so um, I would have thought that you'd still feel feel the vibration from that, but somehow I guess the engine has got mounts on it, and it's, there's a lot of wood in there to attenuate things. And I did, a, I have a uh, Dynavibe, and I did a test on, on mine before the crank break. Not many people have done that, but it's not, you know, it's like knowing, you know, I, I was flying with the thing, and you could feel the vibration as you climb. And another thing you could tell is a different level of vibration, and I've forgotten which way it was. I think it vibrates when you turn left, but it doesn't vibrate when you turn right. And there are vice versa. It's been a long time. But, um, that, tell, that, that just verifies the theory, except this time it's, it's, uh, it's the turn that, that one, one blade gets a better bite than the other. In the other direction, it doesn't make much difference. But um, that was just interesting data. But when I, when I put a fifth bearing on there and climbed out the first time, it was smooth as could be. And it, so all the energy is going, it's getting dissipated through the whole airframe, and it's not getting burned up in that joint that's so fragile. So, Let's see. Um, let me see if I, what I'm forgetting here. Um, yeah, okay, so I covered that. Next, are we done yet? No. Okay, so I'm going to go through this crap just because I just want you to know stuff happens. And obviously, I'm telling you all that I'm an idiot at maintenance, apparently. I don't know jack about building engines. And uh, I'm not a good, really good at attention to detail, but hopefully. Y'all realize that this is this all happened to me, <laughs> and, and so one guy. So just you know, spread it around a little bit. You know, some of you guys are going to end up doing what I'm talking about. And so the, the first one I told you about, the dead stick where I went into Redstone Arsenal Airport, and um, they weren't real happy about that because it's a res it's restricted airspace, and uh, and I landed without permission because I wasn't talking to anybody on the radio. And uh, so, um, anyway, they kept sent some security guys out. And of course, I had my camera sitting on the seat. They want to know why I'm flying over their installation, taking pictures in a restricted area. And I said, well, I, why did you land here? And I'm like, well, you see all that oil running out of the front of the Cali? And you know, he go over and grab the prop, and it just flops around. And I said, I had to land here. Oh, well, OK. But anyway, um, so crank break number two was I was testing a prop for somebody, really sort of for myself and for somebody too, somebody else also. But I just I just got this, this standard test I do where I, I climb out and then go, I climb at 120 miles an hour, which is what, what I usually climb out at uh, with the Corvair. And, um, and, I, and so that's a you know well-defined path. And I go to 7,500 feet and then I level it out. And then I go back and look at the data stream from the EIS. And uh, you can do the math on okay, is it how how well does this thing climb? How well does it? How fast will it go? And all that kind of junk. So I was doing this for this prop that somebody had sent me, and um, I took off from my from my airport, and I went uh, I went west for whatever reason. I don't normally fly west. I usually fly elsewhere. I was like, oh, I'll just go west. Well, I don't go out there very much. Uh, I'll just go that way. So I went that way. I was climbing, felt the usual vibration. And all of a sudden, it got really, really bad. And, uh, and I, I, had, oh, I, it, I it leveled off. I was like, well, I'm almost at 7,500. And I was like, yeah, it seems like a, maybe that, that, you know, the vibration came back and made itself, you know, reminded me about it. And then I pushed the nose over, thinking, well, it's going to go away. And it never went away. It got worse. And so it broke within five seconds after leveling off. And so, OK, well, I knew what to do, because I've been doing nothing but practicing Dead stick landings. I knew that I had way plenty of altitude because I can climb. I can glide way better than I can climb. So, you know, my best glide speed is somewhere around 80, maybe 85, somewhere around in there. 
And I was like, well, I've got, I got, I got time to burn. You know, I did a U-turn and you know, switched it off to save the engine and glided back to my runway with about 2,000 feet to burn. And I, you know, I didn't even get nervous. I knew I could make it. I, I had it in, in my head already. Well, I came in so high, um, I had to do one extra lap around the airport. And then I came in to land, and I, I, uh, I forgot that um, there was a wind wind factor involved in it. That was, you know, because it was early in the morning, but I hadn't really paid much attention to the wind, so I dropped the ball. But if I'd known that the wind was coming right down the runway in my direction, I wasn't going to make it. So I was like, well, no sweat. I switched it off. I can switch it back on, right? Well, the problem was when I took off, it was 22 degrees. You glide for 10 minutes, and it cools off to nothing. It's stone cold 22 degrees. Well, you gotta have one finger for the primer button. You gotta have one finger for the starter, a hand for the starter button. Who's flying the plane now? You know? And so, I ended up, up you know, and, and you're, you've just figured this out a couple of hundred yards out from the end of the runway. And you ain't got time to start it anymore. You're just packing it in. So I took out, there's a little row of, of rubble out with little bushes and things. Uh, at the end of between the cotton field and the runway that nobody ever bothered to cut. And I took that guy, I trashed one of my wheel pants, I just plopped right through that thing. It, it's, I pretty much, I had to, it, you know, I stalled it basically two or three feet off the runway. I, I know where it stalled and I'm like, I'm not going to pull it back anymore, but anyway, it, it dropped in right on that little row of brush and I cleaned out, the, cleaned out one of my wheel pants. But other than that, it didn't hurt the plane. Well, there's a data point for you. When I redid Fos, uh, uh, Jim Fong's plane, I put the primer button right under the starter button. <coughs> Get them both at one time while you're, while you're still flying the plane, just in case. And besides, really, you need, you know, you need to pull the tail back when you start it anyway. So, and and I, don't, I don't do the prime at all and fire a bunch of, uh, of fuel into the system and then, and then try to start it. I believe in... Giving, giving it primer and, and running the starter at the same damn time, and the instant it finally gets a combustible mixture, it's going to fire up, and then you can quit. You don't have to worry about flooding it that way. Um, okay, so that's that story. I'm just, anybody gets tired of me telling more stories, you're welcome to, I'm not going to hold you hostage, but I, I kind of want to mention some little detail out of all of these. The, the broken balancer deal was, I was flying to Cortland to a, uh, a little race, one of the local, I mean, it's a, that's not part of our Air Venture Cup, but you probably know what it's called. But they have these local races. Uh, they have one up here every year, too, I think. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I was going to fly, I was flying to Cortland, and, um, and I, I got, I was, you know, I didn't bother to climb real high, because I mean, it's just 30, 30 miles away, and I was at 4,500, maybe, something like that. And, uh, and or I was cheating for, yeah, 4,500, 4, because I was going west. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the um, the engine just started. You know, it's, just, it's like like the washing machine when when the you know you got shoes in there or something and it goes crazy. All of a sudden, they went from running like a sewing machine to your washing machine's about to explode. And then it quit. And you turn the key, and nothing happens. And what had happened is a harmonic balancer bolt had broken that that holds it on. And the whole flywheel and everything's connected to that. And the, the, the thing just got all sideways and locked it up. The engine quit. Well, that's not good. <laughs> so, so I happened to be over the interstate though. So I looked in one direction. It was rush hour. It was five o'clock, you know, or five forty-five on a Friday afternoon. And there's traffic everywhere. And there's a clover. I looked one way. I turned that way, and there was clover leaf cars everywhere. I'm like, I'm not dealing with that. Cause, am I going over the bridge or under the bridge? I mean, you got no options, you know, when there's exits there and stuff. So I turned and looked the other way. It was packed too. But there was a little gap in the in the line, and I'm like, you know, as I got closer, it's like, yeah, thank God for left lane bandits, man. And I, I ended up putting it into about a half a mile space, but behind some guy who was holding up, or I guess in front of some guy who was holding up traffic, and and I put it on the interstate, um, flawless landing. And uh, I mean, I came to an immediate stop, put it on, put, put, pulled off. I got real lucky that there's no no side rail, guardrails, or any of that junk, and. Um, 
hopped out and pushed it off the off the and not for me, anybody even had to slow down for me, you know? <laughs> but um, something I didn't think about then until much later was um, I noticed as I was I was flying over that place that there's some of those, I guess they're 440 kilovolt lines, those big guys that they don't normally stick big with orange bottles on and all that stuff. And I thought I thought back on it and was like, and I really hadn't put this out of my mind, but as I was gliding in, I saw one telephone, one one power line go over my head. There's six of them there. Where were the rest of them? They were below me. I went through the top one. Yeah. What's the spacing on those? I don't know. That's, huh? I don't think it's 20 feet. I'm thinking 10 or 12. I don't know. But um, but anyway, I came that close to slicing myself in half. So I'm a lucky idiot. Um, so and I, I went back out there and verified it. Sure enough, there is a 440 kilowatt line crossing right there. It took me five minutes on Google Maps or Google Earth to to actually pick it out, but, but it is right there, right where I thought it was. It kept going, I know it's right here, right here, right here. And I was looking for a pattern going this way and it actually crossed like that, which is why I couldn't pick it up. Anyway, okay, so that's that story. Um, other than whether I could, I could go on forever with all these stories, they're all a long story. But, uh, number three was um, was to take it off out of my father's farm. Everybody's heard that story. The engine crapped out at 160 feet of altitude. I was, I was over woods and I could I could uh, I was already turned over the woods and there's no place to go you can't I couldn't get back to the runway no way with 160 feet I knew that already they didn't even try and that's the beauty of knowing all these numbers like I can't make that they're not even gonna look I'm not even gonna try I'm not even gonna think about it just gonna go over here talk and do so I put it in a hay field um, and I had I was trying to get into a long a bigger hay field over this line of trees but um, I, I became obvious I wasn't gonna make it and the last thing you want to do is go through the top of an 80 foot tall tree, have that grab your gear leg and tumble you to the ground because you're a dead man when that happens. So I was like, okay, I'm stuffing it in the ground. And that's what I did, tore it up. Um, so the, uh, the next one, I, it was, was uh, I think I had uh, 18 hours on, uh, on Jim Fong's plane when it spun a bearing. It had low oil pressure and I had a chunk of aluminum plug in one of the, uh, one of the main uh, bearing uh, oil passages. That I found that when I took it apart. It's like, where did this came from? Well, I later figured that out. But, um, so it, it, uh, it just started, it started, you know, the, the oil pressure was, was real low. It started, it started losing RPMs. There's your first clue. starting to lose RPMs. Like, what's up with this? And now I look at the oil pressure. It's like, wow, look at that. And so, uh, so anyway, I, I, I managed to, I switched it off. Um, I could have made it back. Um, but I didn't want to seize, you know, completely seize the engine up, kill the crank, crank it killed the crank anyway, it was already dead. But the next time, I had to do a biennial, not a biennial, a condition inspection. Because, hey, I can't do it myself because I didn't build a plane. So, so I had to pay a guy to come over and look at it. One of the things he wanted me to do was pull the, uh, pull up all the junk out. He wanted me to move some lines and stuff so that he could verify the carburetor connection. He wanted to look at the carburetor connection and make sure it was good and tight because he was going to sign this thing off. So, so I did all that. Well, one of the things in the way was the oil line, which runs right behind the exhaust system, because it's tight under that dang cowling. If you've noticed, it's a really tight cowling built around that engine. It just it fits the form of the engine. So that's about the only place left, and that's where it was originally on the plane. I just kind of when I rebuilt it, I put it back. I tried not to change a bunch of stuff for no reason, but um, I forgot to. Put the P-clamp back in place that holds that guy up to the engine block and away from the exhaust system. So it it burned a hole through the through the um, through the line, and all the oil leaked out. So and I realized that well, I have a low oil pressure light that comes on. It's just an idiot light out of a Beetle. You're below five psi, idiot. You're out of oil. Well, I was 20 miles from the dang airport. No oil. Great. This is perfect. So, and I only had about four or 5,000 feet, and there's no airports out there. So I, uh, I, I didn't switch it off. I pulled it back it's, uh, just to somewhere like 2,000, just enough. And that's another thing you need to do in your phase one testing. Figure out what your minimum airspeed is that you can do and not, not, you know, lose, you know, not lose altitude. 
And so that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to get there at minimum speed and um, and still have the engine turning to, to keep, you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to make it if the engine wasn't turning. So I knew what it would take to get me there without losing the altitude. So I, I, so I went to that speed, throttled it back at that RPM, and um, and made it back to the, to the airport. Um, Y'all heard of that one, the dead stick, I mean, the sucked valve from, you know, coming out of Oshkosh. And um, it's, it's just, you've all read that story, I guess, if you haven't. Uh, I uh, sucked about at 7,500 feet. I was climbing to 9,500 to come back from Oshkosh. I guess that was three or four years ago. And um, and it, it had a, it, it, the valve head came off and it just launched that engine in about three or four seconds. And uh, I knew I was in trouble when you try to operate the starter and all the prop, that the prop just does that and bang, you know, that's all it does is, it's like, okay, so that's, that engine's toast. It's not turning anymore. Okay, so. You get all this history out there, and if you're an idiot like me, and you put it on the internet. The insurance company's buying all this stuff, so it has it has uh, implications, and you also can get real hard to insure. And uh, I probably pay more for liability insurance than anybody in this dang room because of the stuff I put on the internet. And um, and so there's in the in the grand scheme of things, and I, that's why I don't I don't even uh, pay for passengers anymore, you know, because the price is double and. Uh, because they're worried, so I'm, I'm going to kill somebody, and it's justifiable, and that's why I'm not out here volunteering to fly people all the time. So um, I'm an idiot. My planes are crap. <laughs> you don't want to fly with me. So, uh, so it, I suggest just get liability only. Don't buy. You know, whole insurance is is uh, if you if you roll a thing up in a bottle, you're going to want all the dang parts. You can build another one, aren't you? That's the way I think about it. So, so yes, anyway, and every once in a while I also learned that I, I was getting my insurance. I guess that's his recording this. I won't say who I was getting it with, but, but I, you know, you get insurance for, for 10 or 12 years from the same folks. It's just like anybody else. It's like car insurance. You don't go shopping every once in a while. And these guys were telling me, we can't find anybody that will insure you except there's one company and they want, you know, some crazy sum of money. And you feel like, gee, I'm getting uninsurable. I'm thankful that this one company would insure me. And but I got tired of it. Fretting over, it was like, just for kicks, I got something in the mail from a Bimco. It's like they said, well, well, you know, we'll insure you. Give, us, give us a try. So I sent it in. Half price, half price from a Bimco. <laughs> like, bye bye, guys. You know. So now I go with a Bimco. Don't tell them I got their insurance. They cut me off. <laughs> Next. Okay, Mark. On you, the last slide there, especially on the one on I-65. Is yeah. the FAA not involved in any of those? Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of that story I can tell you, and I'll tell you real quick what happens. If, if um, state troopers get wind of it, which they are, uh -huh. it's 911. Everybody's got to call 911. Oh, yeah. State troopers show up. The minute they show up, he's on the phone talking to the FAA guy. The FAA guy, said, what he wants the state trooper to do is come check my fuel tanks to see if I'm empty. They want to know if they can blame that on me. You know, the guy that helped me, you know, there's, you know, there's a reason for that. People, people didn't run out of fuel, but he wanted to check my fuel tanks. And I'm like, God, I left full fuel seven minutes ago, but yeah, sure, you know, you're welcome to check it. And so he goes over and looks, he goes, yeah, there's plenty of that gas in that tank. And I said, I got another one over here, check it too. Yeah, there's plenty of gas in that tank. Well, the FAA told him, don't let him move that plane. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, wait a minute. What do you mean don't move that plane? You want me to leave it sitting on the side of the interstate all night? And so I called the FAA. Oh, actually, the state trooper was talking to the FAA on the cell phone. He said, I said, let me talk to that guy. And I said, look, I, I'm just going to put it, I'm, you know, going to put it on, on a, the way I do my airplanes is I take the tail wheel off. You never know when you might need to tow your plane on. So uh, I, I bought a little Harbor Freight trailer hitch ball thing, and, uh, and I made a, an adapter for my tax ring. And so, uh, so I just take the tail wheels, the tail spring off, and bolt that guy up in there with two bolts, and I pull it down the road backwards, and uh, travels great, you know. So, um, so uh, you know, I had my wife already headed that way, and he says, "Well, I can't get down there until tomorrow morning, you know, about nine or ten o'clock." And I'm like, "What do you want me to do? Live on the side of the interstate?" He says, "Well, why don't you just have some of your people stay with it overnight?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Who do you think I am?" <laughs> But I don't have people. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got so much money, you got. Yeah. I was going. I told him I was going to Cortland to do, to run the race. You know, and he's like, oh, you got people then. 
Yeah, that's stupid. But anyway, the guy showed up in my hangar the next day. I had to show him what was wrong with it and explain to him what it meant and, and uh -huh. actually wrote the report for him. And then when he left, he forgot his notebook. I had to chase him down the road to give him his notebook back. <laughs> Don't give me stuff. Don't give me stuff. <laughs> um, there was another one I was going to mention something about. Oh, the Oscars thing um, on the way back from Oscars. Uh, I went down. OK, so I went. I, mean, I guess most of y'all heard the story. So maybe if you hadn't, I'll try to be brief. What time is it anyway? I'm way over. Two minutes. You're good. Oh, well, that sounds good. Uh, so, what happens is the thing crapped out. I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of what's going on. I got the range rings. I'm like, it's only one airport I can make it to. And I've forgotten the identifier now. But it was a, I think it was a 3,000, I think a 3,000 foot runway, about 150 feet wide, out in the middle of, of uh, Oshkosh farmland. I'm like, it's all I need, man. This is perfect. You know, it was a, it was a grass strip, some private, some guy's private strip. And it's like this is Cape Cod, man. So, I, so I'm flying in there, coming in high as I can be, just so I can find it and pick it out. And I keep looking, and I keep looking, and the GPS is telling me it's right there, and I don't see it. It's, I don't see it. I see, I do see something that looks like it used to be about 200 feet of a 3,000 foot runway, with a whole bunch of corn planted on the rest of it. And so the guy sold the land the, the uh, year before, and, and the, the new owner planted it all in corn. And so, uh, so I'm like, okay, not going there. And, but there's a road there. Like, put it, put it on that road. And I'm down to, you know, I burned up, I did a whole extra loop around this place trying to say, where is the stupid airport? And I finally said, that's got to be it. So, so I turned towards the road, and as I was lined up on the road, there's some trees down the road a little bit. Here comes an 18 wheeler coming out between the trees, you know, right heading my way. And I'm like, okay, we're not going there either. So I ended up putting it, uh, the only place left, and I only had like 50 feet of altitude at that point, was in a bean field. And y'all probably know that story. Took out, uh, took out, what was it, 22 rows of corn, Larry? <laughs> Larry counted the rows of corn for me. So I had no how much to pay for. Uh, in the end, but uh, took out 22 rows of corn and didn't even scratch the, the paint on the wings of that airplane out there. And so that one I'm flying out there is the one I put in the cornfield. Anyway, I guess uh, is there, there's another. Is there another slide? I think so. Yeah. How about what number are we up to? Oh, well, you don't know. No. Um, that, that's it. That's as far as it goes. Yeah. Watch, watch out for power lines if you decide to land on a road. The roads are not the greatest place to land. I'm a big fan of landing in fields. They're very forgiving. But another thing you got to watch out for uh, in fields is, um, you know, this stuff will wrap around your dang gear legs and nose you over instantly. Don't ask me how I know that, but uh, it, it happens. And um, so um, you can't always count. You may end up on your back getting a, ba a bath of gasoline. So it's kind of a good idea to start turning masters off. Once the engine's dead, you might as well you know, and that's why it's a good idea to have a battery-powered GPS. You turn everything else off, and the GPS is still, at least you can glide to where you're going, but everything else is turned off. And I'm not telling you all anything you don't already know. It's, a, it's all out there in the, all of what the EAA does and, and all that kind of stuff. But another thing you got to worry about is guardrails, road signs, power poles. You know, wingspan of an airplane is considerably more than, a, than your average, you know, road. Deer. Hmm? Deer. Deer, yeah. Can't help that. yeah. I ain't much you can do when a deer shows up in front of you. Just yeah. take it. Slip. Take it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so another thing is that it, I got done writing, writing all this stuff, and I say, well, you know what? The powerful few pages is a pretty good argument for why you would want something like an O200. And, and really, if I had to go back and look, if I had to do it over again, huh? Save the movie like Yeah. Um, really. As much money as I've gotten, Corvairs haven't torn these, you know, built, rebuilt, yeah. built again, another crankshaft, all the over and over and over again. And even with the Volkswagen, I've had to do I know a lot of you guys have great luck with that, and I hope it continues for you. But, um, but, it's, O200s are dirt simple, and people, you know, they're, people sell them all the time for three, four, five thousand bucks, and take it apart, put some new rings in it. Do a valve job on it. 
do what Larry Flesner did, fly for 1,500 hours or whatever, <coughs> 2,000 or something. We already have 1,500 or 1,700. That 1,800, I put it to 24. If I'd have known what good shape it was, I'd have never touched it. And let the record show, I kept telling him, do not tear that thing down. Keep flying that thing. But anyway, uh, he tore it apart and said, said the crank looked like it was brand new. I mean, a lot of it looked like it was brand new. So anyway, um, what else? Uh, is that the last one? Yep, that's the last one. Okay, so here, so I'm finally done. So um, sorry, I just rambled out here. Ramble, ramble. Yeah. And said that Mark, the guy was uh, flying one of the composite airplanes with uh, 360 light combing. Him and his wife was up north, New York, or somewhere. Put it into a small but night broken crank on a mm -hmm. light combing. It, but they both walked away. It does happen. So it happens. But. It's a whole lot more likely to happen in something other than a certified plane. One of those bomb-proof, way under stress crankshafts. So, so in that thing, I mean, I've broken my O200 numerous times. Yeah. I've broken parts in it, but it just continues to run. Yeah. I've never even dropped a cylinder. And, and you know, I've, I've, had, I've broken uh, valve rocker bosses and things like that, but I've always found them just doing routine maintenance. One of the things that one of the cool things about a Corvair or any six-cylinder is, for example, a story that um, that uh, um, uh, yeah, what's his name of Fort Lauderdale, Steve. Um, anyway, he's a KR net guy. Mackish. Mackish. Uh, he took off from Sunny Fun one year, and he had he had really not quite done the due diligence on his valve train geometry to where everything was centered and you know working right and, and the, the path of the rocker was all was a little hosed up. And somehow when he parked it, he uh, one of the cylinders just one of the push rods just fell out of where it was. And uh, so he, he took it off he took off. He started up and he said, Yeah it runs a little rough. Maybe I got one cylinder flooded or something. I don't know. So anyway he flew it home, took off the five cylinders, flew it all the way home, didn't think anything of it. He was running on five cylinders. You, know, you try that in a 0300 or running on three cylinders and that you probably won't climb like that I don't think. But that's the that's the attraction of a six cylinder. And um, and one of the one of my favorite traits of the of the Corvair. Um, so I I've, I've got so much money invested in it. I got so dang many Corvair parts and you've probably seen the picture I got everything it takes to put another one together and that's what's going in my plane when I redo it. Any questions? Anybody? I've got a couple of things. Oh, there it is. I'll already. I can't even talk. Okay, I'm done. Oh, you want this? Yeah. Careful. Don't step in front of that. Yeah. <laughs>